Around the turn of the century, the bicycle brought about so much change. It aided in the women's liberation movement, it changed women's clothing, it changed the way men and women went on dates, it changed the way the average person got around. And this time period between when the bicycle caught on and before the automobile became popular was a time of significant change. The Iowa bike came to the States in Colorado's first year. There were no American makers for a couple years, but having seen the British product, Colonel Pope decided he wanted to make them here, and they spread on the East Coast pretty rapidly. Approximately 1869, uh, a bicycle showed up in Denver. There's a reference to it, and it said that a velocipede showed up on the streets of Denver, and it caused much consternation among the local populace, and the horses. It frightened the horses. This was a recreation for men at that time, and particularly for middle class men. Ladies could not properly mount an ordinary bicycle and ride it because of the, the uh, embarrassing procedure for mounting it and of course the dangers to modesty from the process of pedaling it. A woman wasn't supposed to let any light be seen between her legs and uh, the clothing style was long dresses. And if you can imagine sitting on one of these high wheel bikes with a long dress and hoops and petticoats, it just doesn't work. So the only women that rode in the early days were circus ladies, and circus ladies weren't ladies. <laughs> so right from the beginning, bicycling in Colorado and, and in the Denver area and, and elsewhere was very much a man's sport and a sport of the middle class and the upper class because the bikes were expensive at first. We were a cycling town. We had more bicycles per person here in Denver than any other city in the country, twice. I believe in 1896 and again in 1900. So Denver was a cycling town. The first bicycle shop was started by George E. Hannon in 1880. And at the same time, he founded the first bicycle club in Colorado, which was the Denver Bicycle Club. Georgie Hannon operated out of his shop, which was on Lawrence Street, downtown Denver. And so his rides took place from there. I believe the first year in business, he only sold two bicycles. The next year he sold 15. And then, zoom, you know, from there it went up. It seems like the bicycle caught on fairly quick. People were genuinely interested. The type of people that rode the bike were more of the privileged class. Uh, a lot of people that tried to do a crossing in the states. It's sort of like Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic. People tried to cross the states. And the first person to succeed was named Thomas Stevens. He'd been raised in Springfield, Missouri. And he ended up in the Denver area in 1882, 1883, and decided he'd take the challenge, but he'd reverse the direction. So Thomas Stevens started out for San Francisco April 22nd, 1884 riding eastward and he rode to Boston and he had a lot of adventures in the process. He was following the Union Pacific Rail Track, went up over Donner Pass and then down into Reno and he continued to follow the Union Pacific to Salt Lake City and through Wyoming and across Nebraska and uh, when he was following the tracks he got caught once with a train coming the other way when he was on a bridge and he had to hang the bike over the edge and lay down on the ties at the side. He uh, kept a diary, and the diary has been uh, put into actually two volumes called Around the World on a Bicycle. His plan was not to go around the world. His plan was 
looped across the U.S. But when he got to Boston on his Columbia brand bike, he stopped in at the head offices in Boston and he uh, met with Colonel Albert Pope. And uh, Colonel Pope said, hey, let me sponsor you and you go around the world the rest of the way and I'll give you the new expert model. So uh, he continued and uh, the first volume covers San Francisco to Tehran and the second volume covers Tehran back to San Francisco. Later on, by about the late 1880s, you begin to see a new kind of bicycle appear on the scene. A bike that looks a lot like the bikes we're familiar with today. They call them the safety bicycle. To differentiate from the high wheel or the ordinary, which was the large wheel, the big wheel, the safety bicycle was um, smaller wheel. It started out uh, as a 30 inch wheel. In 1888, the pneumatic tire was commercialized by John Dunlop, who was a veterinary surgeon. And he didn't do it as a commercial venture at first. He did it for his son. His son had a trike with wooden spoke, wooden rim, and didn't like running on the cobblestones because it was a rough ride. And so his son came back one day and said, hey dad, can you make it run smoother? And his dad, John Dunlop, took some surgical tube, invented a little valve, put it on, and made it ride much better and the kid came back and said thank you it not only rides much smoother but it goes faster too and he said faster aha and so he made some to fit the cycle racers cycles and introduced cycle racers to them who were losers and they started to win and if anything wins it gets adopted by 1893 pretty much all the bikes used pneumatic tires the wood rim came at the same time. The wood rim, by the way, was uh, forgiving. It was cheaper to make than the steel. There's a lot of qualities of the wood rim. And then the pneumatic tire instituted the change, downsized the wheel, became even easier for the women to ride. The frame became lighter. It was quite a uh, innovation. Safety bicycle of the 1880s and 1890s looks a lot like the, the contemporary mountain bike with the straight handlebar and and the uh, fat balloon tires. Today we look at a ride to the top of Pikes Peak as being extremely difficult. I can imagine it to some, it would have been an impossible task. But William Perkins and his brother seem to have done it. They've got some wonderful shots from them on their way up. Must have been a beautiful sight at the time. Unpaved roads all the way up, probably just graded for horse and buggy. Uh, they've got some wonderful shots at the top of Pikes Peak. If you were going to ride to the top of a mountain, you'd want your gear ratio to be as low as you could get it. So by putting a smaller chain ring up front, that would give him the climbing ability to get to the top of the mountain. When you're coming down the mountain, you wouldn't need the large chain ring because most of the time you'd be coasting. You'd just need to rely on your brakes. William Perkins had a hard tire safety bike, which would have been a bike with nothing more than a hard rubber hose wrapped around a steel rim. Without the comfort of the air suspension that we have provided by our pneumatic tires, it didn't have the cantilever type brakes that we had. It would have had uh, spoon type brakes that rubbed on a tire. You'd have to ride down the hill very carefully so that you didn't break your equipment or wear out your brakes. Um, we can see by some of the photos that we have that uh, one of the gentlemen did manage to break his bike going down the hill, broke the fork right off his Victor bicycle. On the bottom of the photograph, there's a, a little bit of writing that says Vulcan adopting a clothes ringer, and that's a comment on his broken bike. I'm sure a ride to the top of Pikes Peak would have put it to the test, or at least coming back down from Pikes Peak would have put it to the test. So it shows it was a tough journey, not only up to the top of Pikes Peak, but also down, much like mountain biking is today.
This is a Victor made by the Overmoon Wheel Company. This is a very good example of the bicycle that uh, W.E. Perkins would have ridden to the top of Pikes Peak. It's a classic example of a hard tired safety. This one happens to be cushion. This is very typical of the first transitional bikes from the high wheeler. If you notice the uh, frame and the wheel size, there are 30 inch wheels. Uh, some of them are 32. The brakes are spoon brakes, same as the old high wheel or ordinaries. Uh, you can look at the rods on the brakes, what they call rod brakes, they're the large handles. They were sort of effective in stopping the bicycle, but not really very effective. If you notice the grips, they were formed of what they call ebonite. It's very similar to a composition of a billiard ball. If you notice the seat, this is very typical of the high wheel seats of the era. They hadn't changed yet to the safety, the later type safety bike seats, which were simpler. They were precise on their threading and spoking and so forth. The hubs were very finely machined. Most everything was machined on this bicycle instead of being forged. And the adjustable crank set, very, very nicely done. Precise adjustment for tightening the chain. This is direct drive, so the pedals at high speed would continue to rotate. As you were coasting, you had to get your feet off the pedals or, or you'd get beaten. So uh, you rest them on the front foot pegs. It didn't take very long before bicyclists began to challenge one another to see who was fastest. Bicycle racing became a very popular sport in Colorado, particularly in the Denver area. Bicycle clubs built race tracks. Racing was very important back then. Uh, very important, much more than it is today in this country. They had particular tracks, you might say they're fields. There was one at uh, the ballpark at 6th and Broadway. The Denver Athletic Club built a racetrack over on what is now the East High School tennis courts here in Denver at the southwest corner of City Park. The Ramblers, their track pretty much was uh, Sportsman Park downtown where Elitch stands today. A lot of their races, world records were set there. The other in order of importance was the Denver Athletic Club grounds, which is on 6th and Broadway. There were many, many records, probably more records set there than Sportsman's Park. Well, the Greeley path started at Sand Creek along the road to Brighton. And they used to race on that path. It was called the Sandpaper Track. They kept it smooth, they raced, very, very popular. The railroads in Colorado soon recognized the popularity of bicycling and pretty quickly figured out a way to make some money off of it. Club races would often be staged over the road. One of the most popular races was the so-called buttermilk race, which was staged along the railroad right-of-way up towards Brighton. The railroad, seeing these great crowds gathered for the race, began to sell tickets. They would run special trains and transport the spectators on kind of a moving grandstand along with the race. And then they would also transport uh, the racers to and from the starting points on the racetrack. By the 1880s, the popularity of bicycling, particularly in Denver's middle and upper classes, led some of the cyclists to organize bicycling clubs. And these clubs functioned both as social clubs and political organizations. As the number of bicycles on the streets swelled, inevitably there were conflicts between cyclists and pedestrians, cyclists and horses and carriages and sometimes the city would try to rein in the cyclists, so to speak, with proposed laws that would ban them from the streets or require them to use the sidewalks or prohibit anyone over the age of 12 from riding a bicycle on a sidewalk. And the clubs proved to be very effective in organizing and bringing political pressure to bear on city governments to prevent the enactment of these kinds of measures. They were also, of course, primarily social organizations and some of them were very wealthy. For example, the two most powerful bicycle clubs in Denver in the 1890s were the Denver Wheel Club and the Denver Athletic Club's Bicycle Division. Both of these clubs owned very extensive clubhouses. The Denver Wheel Club's 
clubhouse downtown in Denver was virtually a mansion with billiard rooms, bowling alleys, a swimming pool, dining rooms, apartments that members could rent if they needed to stay downtown overnight. The extent of these clubs underscores the wealth and the social and political power of these groups. When the Denver Wheel Club opened their, their new clubhouse uh, in 1897, 1,700 people were invited for the opening ceremonies. Around the turn of the century, the Denver Bicycle Manufacturing Company manufactured the bicycle in the early 1890s, continued up through the turn of the century and sold for approximately $14 because the bicycle industry at that time was competing with the automobile industry. So the price came down, they weren't as light as they were, they weren't quite as refined. The rims are uh, original rims, they're made by Lobdell, they're painted wood. Tires are the single tube pneumatics John Dunlop uh, invented. They're glued onto the rims. The uh, seat, it, it's like a piece of uh, formed plywood which was bent. Underneath the leather is actual horsehair. And it uh, was soft and compressed and they could work with it. The hole in the center was um, to bring air to cool the seat. In the 1880s, and certainly in the 1890s, bicycling's very popularity became a real problem for cyclists and others uh, in, in Denver and around Colorado. As the streets became more congested with bicyclists and pedestrians and horses and carriages, there were inevitably conflicts. And particularly troublesome were the so-called scorchers. Scorchers tended to be young cyclists who wanted to prove their courage and their strength by riding as fast and as recklessly as possible around Denver's streets and parks. Particularly popular was 18th Street in downtown Denver, which was a long, wide, smooth, flat racetrack for some of these young men. And as scorchers became more and more of a menace to pedestrians and horses and the like, the city tried to take measures to bring them to justice. First, they recruited about 25 members of the local cycling clubs who they essentially deputized to go out and patrol the streets, track down and ticket these scorchers and try to bring them to justice. Well, that didn't work out too well because many of the Scorchers were their fellow club members. And so the city in about 1896 hired a full-time cycling squad whose sole duty was to track down and ticket the Scorchers. That became kind of a problem too because as the offending Scorchers were hauled into bicycle court, they would bring witnesses who would swear on the Bible that the bicycle cop was drunk on duty and how could he possibly know in his inebriated state how fast that Scorcher was going. More to the point, it didn't take very long before citizens were complaining about the cycle squad itself being the worst offenders among the Scorchers in the city. The one person who really took that study that made it scientific was Archibald Sharp, and he published a work that combined other people's work and his own. The volume has all the math, it has disc wheels, it has smooth shapes identical to what's being sold today as high-tech wheels. It had all the suspension bikes, uh, full suspension and rear suspension were around by then. The seat with the split down the middle so you don't have pressure on certain places was around. The seat that had two pads that would toggle. Back then they had tangent spoke, they had radial spoke, they had tangent spoke on one wheel radial on the other. 
but all those things were around a long time ago and, and were lost for a long time. And this book has it all with all the math to support every aspect of it. MIT Press in the 1970s, uh, as I understand it, they wanted to come up with a good definitive book on the science of bicycle manufacturing and engineering. And all they could do was reprint the 1896 book because there's nothing to add. They didn't retype that, they just got a copy and scanned it and printed it. And that was the latest in the 1970s, was the same as the latest in the 1890s. The advent of the safety bicycle was very important in the progression of women towards more independence from men. In some places it was not thought proper for a lady to drive a horse and carriage or to ride a horse by herself in a city street. So she had to either walk or rely on a husband, father, brother some other male to provide for her transportation. But now with the bicycle she can get on that bike and pedal away at her own discretion. Initially, women's participation in the bicycling pastime was very controversial. There were those who felt that uh, it was very unwomanly to participate, and the first women that dared to ride their bicycles in public were both scorned and laughed at by onlookers. But soon it became obvious that there was a high degree of popularity among women for the bicycle. And this denunciation of the activity was replaced by an appreciation for the wholesomeness and the health benefiting aspects of bicycling. The early ladies' bikes had the chain drive loop frame, meaning it dropped down room for the dress to go in and that frame was to try to expand the market. The first ads that I see in Ladies Home Journal for bikes are in 1890. By 1896, Ladies Home Journal has about 18 bike ads, including the whole back cover is a big display ad. Women were heavily into it. Now they had a vehicle. A lady could get on a bicycle and maintain her modesty. They had a, a way of getting around that didn't rely on a man. So in a sense, it's an emblem of the emerging liberation of women from men in our, in our culture. Susan B. Anthony has said is the one thing that most supported the women's movement, including gaining the right to vote, was the bicycle. As women became avid cyclists, the restrictive clothing proved to be very cumbersome and a call was raised for a change. And as you can imagine, this desire among women to change their clothing was very controversial. It, however, became obvious that the normal, respectable attire of an 1890s woman with the long skirts and the tight corsets was not only inappropriate for an activity such as bicycling that required a lot of exercise, but it could also prove to be dangerous and even fatal. Just imagine what would happen if this, these long skirts became entangled within the spokes of a bicycle as you were coasting downhill. It could be a disaster. So it didn't take long before popular 1890s cycling publications warned that a special adaptation of a woman's attire was absolutely necessary before undertaking a bicycling excursion. 
So bustles and hip pads were the first items to go because they were just too floppy on a bicycle. And next was the suffocating corset, which was rightfully retired for several reasons. Cycling West Magazine, which was a popular publication at the time, reported that women would ride better, feel better, and look better without these corsets. Also, a man was now relieved of the fear that the lady he was escorting might faint from lack of oxygen flow caused by the aesthetically pleasing but extremely impractical corset. If this occurred, the man would have to suffer the embarrassment of loosening the laces of the corset to revive her. So don't be fooled. This occurrence of change, this acceptance of change, was still somewhat about the man and his comfort level as well as the woman's. Ladies of the cycling persuasion, the time has come to voice your opinion concerning the attire suitable for our favorite two-wheel pastime. The Cycling West presents the Preference Cuba with five choices of cycling costumes. Mail us your choice of ideal dress and we will tally and publish the results. As of December 26, 1895, the short skirt triumph, followed by bloomers with knickerbockers holding up the rear. So ladies, shorten that hymn to your heart's desire, within the bounds of modesty, of course, and hop on that bicycle and scorch the boulevard. Women were still expected to act and to dress modestly. An 1896 brochure entitled Useful Information for the Bicyclists recommended that women not coast on their bikes, not chew gum, not wear a man's cap, or use bicycle sling. And it also reminded women to bring along a needle and a thread just in case they had to repair some torn clothing along the trip. However, knickerbockers and bloomers became acceptable forms of dress for the female bicyclists, especially after the Fellowship for Ethical Research gave these items its stamp of approval. These may seem to be small gains, but at the time they represented a revolution of sorts. This change in modest and restrictive clothing, this newfound freedom and independence on wheels. In these ways, the bicycle gave women new hopes and new experiences, and it provided them with the means to achieve these. Any questions about the health consequences of bicycling as it pertained to women should have been put to rest by the exploits of Denver's petite but Herculean mistress of the road, Dora Ellen Thornworth Reinhardt, the wife of A.E. Reinhardt, a prominent Denver photographer. Dora Reinhardt took up cycling in the fall of 1895 as part of her efforts to recover from a bout of scarlet fever. Her doctor warned her against it, but she persisted. And by the following summer, she was riding centuries, 100-mile bike tours, sometimes on a daily basis. At one point, she rode 20 consecutive centuries in 20 days. It's worth remembering, too, that when Mrs. Reinhardt rode her 10 and 20 consecutive centuries, she was riding it on a very heavy bicycle, primarily over dirt roads. Mrs. Reinhardt's bicycling exploits, I think, underscore how bicycles were part of the larger process of women freeing themselves from male control in our society. It affected their wardrobe. Mrs. Reinhardt would ride her bike wearing a split skirt, in other words, pants. And she would do so in the company of young men who were not relatives. There's a photograph of Mrs. Reinhardt riding her bicycle into Laramie, Wyoming after a two-day trip from Denver in the company of two young men, neither of whom is her husband or her brother. Quite clearly, Mrs. Reinhardt did not feel that there were any negative moral implications to her setting out on a two or three day bicycle trip in the company of two young men. Now others may have thought otherwise, but 
She seems to be emblematic of a, of a changing attitude towards and about women and their independence in American society. And in her mind, at least, there were no moral implications to this. This is a 1896 ladies Douglas brand bike. Mrs. Reinhardt rode the 17,200 miles in 1896. She was riding a Stearns brand bike. It's basically the same equipment, but a different maker. So this is equivalent in weight and maneuverability to the bike that she rode. The stopping is really done with the pedals. This bike has no brakes. Basically, the braking was done by just back pressuring the roll of the pedal. But this is a chain drive. There is no gear shifting. When the pedals move, the wheel moves. And conversely, when the wheels move, the pedals move. This bike's equipped with a bell. The bell rolls on the front wheel when the chain is pulled by the operator, it puts the bell down onto the wheel. It's a continuous action ringing bell. The bike has a basket and it just slips right off so a lady could have her shopping in the basket, put it on the bike and ride home. The grips are cork. The leather saddle has a split center, a lot like modern saddles the last five to ten years. The rims are wood. Wood's a very light and strong material. You can see the lacing from the fender down to just above the hub and the lacing across the chain guard. That lacing is to keep the ladies' skirts and petticoats from getting caught in the spokes or getting caught in the chain. This bike is finished with a black lacquer and decals. The decals have hand-painted gold surrounds with starbursts. The bike's also finished in a nickel plate on the shiny parts. The bike's cost is the end of the high-priced bike period, $150. Ten years later, bikes were down to four to seven dollars, but at this point they were still half a year's pay for a workman. So it was a prized possession and the quality of the finish mattered to people. It was an issue of style and so you had to have it look nice. Holiday and weekend cycling in particular and sometimes in the evening became by the 1880s and 1890s, a very important recreation for people in Colorado, whether in Denver or in Leadville or Aspen or wherever. The Sunday outing on a bicycle was a very important social event, a middle-class social event. Young couples would ride out the uh, Broadway bike path to Petersburg and beyond to Littleton to have picnics along the Platte River. Groups of young men and women would have outings together. I remember when bicycles were the popular means of going on outings. Every Sunday during the summer, groups of young people would stream out to the country with their picnic lunches tied to the handlebars of their bicycles. Of course, there were no paved roads like we have now, and it was real work sometimes to pedal the machine over some of the rough dirt roads. On Sundays, we'd take bicycle rides, and I used to take my missus for long rides. We go with about 20 other couples and take our lunch or stop for an ice cream soda. We had a club of riders, and we used to have what they call sentry rides. And many's the time I rode 100 miles on Sundays. They didn't have good roads, and I don't know which was the worst. For as soon as the good roads got here, the traffic got too bad. If people only knowed what was good for them, they'd ride a bicycle. So it was very much a, uh, a community group kind of, of recreation. Bicycling was a popular form of dating. It started with large groups going out and having picnics or little outings. And from there it would branch off into couples leaving and, and going off on their own. It was a wonderful way and a new way of being unchaperoned. 
Again, you have the idea of young women going out on dates with their young men without necessarily having to suffer the chaperonage of a father or a brother. Very often these were group dates, but it wasn't unknown for a young couple to pedal their wheels, as they were called out, for a date all by themselves without supervision. The history of bicycling gives us important insights into a number of fascinating questions. The structure of social power and political power in Colorado and in Denver, and also the structure of race in the city. I have in my book on the history of sports in Colorado, a photograph of two young African-American couples out for a, presumably a Sunday afternoon bicycle ride and picnic. They're immaculately dressed, and they are riding the most up-to-date bicycles available. But what this tells us is that in Denver at the turn of the century, we have a very visible and prosperous African-American middle class. And this is a story that has not been told fully about the history of Denver and its people. The story of the Denver Palmer Lake Bicycle Path is a very important and very interesting one in terms of the history of bicycling and it illustrates the social and political power of bicyclists in Denver and in Colorado around the turn of the century. The Denver Palmer Lake Bicycle Path organization was headed by the sitting governor of the state of Colorado, Alva Adams and they raised money and secured rights of way in order to build a path that would continue the Broadway bicycle path south out of Denver down towards Palmer Lake and a monument. The trail had been used, uh, it had been ridden for many years clear back in the 1800s with the high wheelers. Some of the people chose uh, to ride the whole thing. From Denver they ride to Palmer Lake and come back, which was about a century. You know, it's 52 miles each way. Thousands of riders rode the path you gain an altitude of 2,000 feet. So a lot of the people, of course, would take the train to Palmer Lake for that reason, and they would coast back, you might say, although you don't coast the whole way. Many of the cyclists quickly found out that it was a lot easier to ride north from Palmer Lake to Denver than to ride south from Denver to Palmer Lake. So the railroads began to transport cyclists south to Palmer Lake where they would then get off with their bikes and take the easier ride back to Denver. We haven't found an exact map of the bike route, but from the bits and pieces of information from the manuscript collections at Denver Public Library and other sources, we went to the 1937 aerials and then moved back to a 1901 railroad map different roads are noted on the map. The old wagon road, the new road, and those alignments are shown. It would have been that wagon road that the bicyclists were using. By pulling together a variety of old maps, we were able to document at least the city ditch portion of the bike path with great certainty. The Denver Palmer Lake bike path started on Broadway, ran alongside where the cable car or the trolley was running, and it ran to the city ditch. That crosses Broadway in Englewood, picks that up, and then winds through Englewood and down into Littleton. And it wound south, wound through Petersburg, which doesn't exist anymore. It wound west, wound east, you know, it was very uh, serpentine. In September of 1898, in a publication of the League of American Wheelmen, Andrew Gillette wrote an article about the Denver Palmer Lake cycle path. For the first five miles of its course, the path follows the west side of Broadway, due south from the city. Then upon the brow of a hill, at a point where the city ditch crosses Broadway, it leads off to the right, and from this point to Littleton, 
a distance of some five or six miles, it follows the bends of this stream. This is perhaps the most picturesque part of the entire route, taking the cyclist, as it does, away from the roadway, away from the necessity of watching for teams and pedestrians into the very midst of a luxuriant farm life among fields of waving wheat, barley, oats, alfalfa, and timothy, and resting the eyes upon many a peaceful rural scene. The path turns and twists about, following the devious windings of the stream. The path itself is 10 feet in width and as hard and smooth as it can be, and is bordered for nearly the entire length of the cycle path by large cottonwoods. One of the peculiar features of this path are the cattle guards designed by Peter O'Brien, the city engineer. They are 10 feet by 10 feet in size and are built of timbers placed across the course of the track five inches apart, sufficient to prevent cattle crossing, but causing no unpleasant jar to wheels. And then it comes into the area that we know today as Woolhurst. Woolhurst was an estate at that time, beautiful trees, lovely spot to stop and there's some photographs that show us that they were there and it shows us what Woolhurst looked like at the turn of the century. Then they're still winding through, part is Chatfield Reservoir today and then it comes very close to the Highline Canal. They crossed over and continued on south. The cycle path ran through the western edge of Highlands Ranch, generally along uh, the same alignment as the Highline Canal Trail does today. This section of the path uh, was also a popular spot for bicycle racing that occurred on the road just adjacent to the path. The National Wheelman's Association had their annual meet here in Denver. Uh, as part of that meet, uh, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad repaired a portion of the course that occurred on the road between Asequa to the south of us here and Sedalia. These cycle races attracted a lot of fans. In fact, the railroad would transport them to various spots along the course for them to cheer. I see him take some nasty falls. Roads was pretty bad in them days. And it paid to use the brakes coming down the hill. Bidwell's hill was one of the worst. It was just sandy as all get out at the bottom. And when you hit that sand, you just have to go right over the handlebars. I, I come down there with a feller, a new rider, and I told him he better use his brake, but he said no, he didn't want to. <laughs> well, he, he hit that sand and off he went, tail over spindle button. I had a lot of fun on that old bicycle. Guess I told you about some of the trips I took, didn't I? When I got through with that bike, I sat down and I figured up my mileage and I found out that I'd been clear around the world if I'd gone in a straight line. Yes, sir. I'd been over 25,000 miles. Went over 365 miles one week. Never did a century run, though. Though I could have, easy as not. Some fellers used to see how many of them they could run up. A great trip was up to Palmer Lake and back. That's 50 miles each way. Now, you're supposed to make it the same day, of course. We know that several property owners along the bike pathway offered a place for the bicyclists to stop and rest. One of them was David Cook, and David's house still stands between Titan Road and Sedalia. And David is mentioned several times in the newspaper articles. Dave Cook's ranch is becoming a famous resort for Denver wheelmen. Mr. Cook has spent a great deal of time and money fixing up the place, and now he is reaping the rewards that he deserves. And then further south, there were several landowners that did the same thing. Proceeding on south, they go through Sedalia, and at Sedalia, they then could decide whether to go down the West Plum Creek route or the East Plum Creek route through Castle Rock. <laughs> 
and many chose the West Plum Creek route that would take them down through Perry Park. The scenic route down Perry Park Road was the preferred route because of the vistas and the valley is so beautiful. And one can imagine that it was a destination for some because of its beauty and they didn't want to go any further than that and others would have ridden through Perry Park and continued on south down into Palmer Lake. In this distance of 50 miles, the path gains an elevation of 2,000 feet, rising from one mile above sea level in Denver to 7,238 feet at Palmer Lake. Palmer Lake is a popular summer resort with a fine hotel, the Rocklands. It is unique in location, being upon the crest of the divide, which here juts out eastward from the Rockies, diverting the waters which fall in its southern slope into the Arkansas River, while those which fall on the northern side find their way into the Platte. A ride by train to Palmer Lake, taking one's wheel, and coasting back to Denver over the new cycle path will make an ideal trip. From Palmer Lake, they took many other excursions. They went as far as the Garden of the Gods, and what a beautiful place to ride around in. And they went over to Manitou, and Manitou is just starting as a resort. Some of the other records reveal another route that they traveled, and that was up Jar Canyon and down Sugar Creek Road to the South Platte, and south on that road to Deckers, and then West Creek, and on down to Woodland Park and into Monument. Around the turn of the 20th century, Senator Ammon sponsored a bill in which $5,000 was allocated for the Denver Palmer Lake bike path. And as early as about 1901, it became obvious that this bike path was not going to be built exactly as it had originally been planned, as a bike only path with a 2% grade following the natural contours of the landscape. By 1903, the money that had been set aside by the state legislature for the bike path was being used instead for improvements to a wagon road between Greenland and Palmer Lake. So bicycle riders had to share this road with wagons and buggies and horseback riders. Nonetheless, it's important to note that despite its diversity of travelers, for many years, this route was still referred to as the Denver Palmer Lake cycle path, which is a clear indication of its significance and its influence. The Good Roads Movement started because of the bicycle. The automobile people like to think they started it, but they didn't. They certainly continued it. You know, the bicycle industry in general is sort of given credit along with a guy named Colonel Pope with paving the roads in this country. He was a, a big advocate of getting that done and that went back to the 1880s, I mean well, well before cars. Uh, he owned the Columbia Bicycle Company and he was just the major powerhouse in the bicycle industry in this country and that was one of the things that he pushed for very hard and got accomplished in a lot of areas was getting improved roads and of course that that buttered his bread because it made it nicer to go out and ride a bike. On the horizon of the cycle path loomed another vehicle that would absolutely revolutionize our ability to travel across the landscape. The people who were the movers and the shakers, the socialites, they were the ones who took to the bicycle. But when the automobile came around, the interest that these movers and shakers once had in the bicycle now shifted to the automobile. The convenience and the luxury of the automobile just transformed travel and the Denver Palmer Lake bike path faded in the dust of this new mode of transportation. <laughs> 
Nonetheless, the dream of the bike path never died. It just went dormant. Portions of the path are found today along the Highline Canal in Douglas County, the City Ditch Route in Chatfield State Park, the Perry Park Road, and the Greenland Trail. And today, this dream is being reawakened by a new generation of bikers and walkers and hikers who are cultivating it into a reality. So history is repeating itself.